Celsius per decade. And what does the IPCC predict is suddenly going to happen from now on for the next nine decades? 0.38, more than three times as much warming per decade as we've seen in the last six decades. There is absolutely no physical basis for any such suggestion. And the Australian government's credibility that gap is even greater. Because they estimate, as their central case, that there will be 50% more warming than the IPCC does. That's the only way they can even attempt to justify the ludicrous policies they're following. So what is the maximum amount of CO2 that we could, um, maximum amount of temperature increase that we could prevent if we stopped emitting any CO2 worldwide today? Answer, 1.7 Celsius. That is all. They don't tell you that, though, do they? Because it would show you how remarkably stupid everything that's going on now is. And that's a worldwide figure. If we close the whole world down, 1.7 Celsius cooler by the end of the century, even if their figures for how much warming you might get are right, which they're not. So let's look at a few peer-reviewed papers that illustrate the other side of the case. And I make no apology for going on a little bit long here. Would you like me to cut this short? No, 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 no. Yes! Yes. I'll take that as a yes. So, um, so I'm going to carry on. So what we've got here is Professor Linton, whose picture you saw earlier, the greatest climate scientist of our age, profoundly knowledgeable about the atmosphere and how it behaves. And he thought of a brilliantly simple experiment. Because what the debate is really all about is what is the rate of change in the net balance of radiation at the top of the atmosphere compared with rates of change of temperature down here. And so he got 11 computer models, all the city teenagers lined up in a row. And these are the models used by the IPCC itself. And he found that they all predicted that as temperature gets warmer, those little boxes in red there, going from left to right, so the amount of radiation escaping to space actually falls. It's against the laws of thermodynamics, but that is what those models are all told and tuned to predict. Now, what I want you to do is to watch the actual record of what happens when we use the Irby and Ceres satellites actually to measure how much radiation is coming off, and we compare that with changes in the rate of temperature of the sea surface, where it's not distorted by all these idiotic uh, sighting of the land thermometers. Now, watch the center of the screen. It looks rather different, doesn't it? And what we're looking at there for a doubling of CO2 is not the 3.3 Celsius predicted by Ipica, but just 0.7 Celsius, a result agreed with by Spencer and Braswell in um, a paper published just last year. Dr. Spencer runs the satellites that uh, Professor Lindsay was using there. And he and his mathematical colleague, Braswell, have identified, they think, and been able to measure for the first time, one of these temperature feedbacks that Ipecac thought was multiplying by three the amount of warming you would originally get from adding CO2 to the atmosphere. And he has found that this feedback, the cloud feedback, is as strongly negative, damping down and reducing the original warming as Ipecac had thought it was strongly positive, amplifying the warming. Once again, the conclusion, 0.5 to 0.7 Celsius for a doubling of CO2 somewhere around the end of this century. Nothing to worry about there. These are peer-reviewed results by credible scientists. Here is an inadvertent confirmation of this by Vince et al. in 2007. And the important thing about this is that Vince is one of the people who are in the conspiracy. He's one of the people who are fostering this whole scare. But his paper shows that evaporation from the Earth's surface happens at three times the, the rate predicted by the models. And that means that the rate of warming that you would expect to occur uh, in, in response to any given forcing of the climate, such as adding CO2, is one third of what the IPCC thinks it is. And here again is the hot spot, and the only thing I'm going to talk about here is how much of a temperature change from a doubling of CO2 we would expect in the absence of the predicted hotspot. And once again, it's only one Celsius compared with three and a quarter. So there are four results. I could go on all night with different results of this kind in the peer reviewed literature saying the same thing. So if anyone dares to tell you that there's a consensus that we're going to get lots of global warming as a result of WCO2, no, we're not. And all of these papers are doing it by measurement 
and observation and not by Xbox 360. So we summarize the results there and you can see the enormous discrepancy between the 3.25 Celsius uh, predicted by the IPCC and the roughly one quarter of that which is more likely to happen if we believe the actual data and measurements. So how much warming will the ETS and the carbon tax prevent? Wouldn't you like to know, boys and girls? Well, here goes. First of all, we need to know how much of total carbon emissions worldwide would not happen if uh, Professor Garneau got his way and the scheme were implemented in full. And that would be 25% reduction in your emissions over the next 10 years. I don't think they'll do more than a fifth of that when the announcement is made on Sunday, but let's pretend. And that's only 1.2% in total of global emissions is the Australian emissions, so that means that even if Ghana got his way, we will be reducing global emissions over the next 10 years by an impressive 0.3%. That in turn would reduce what would otherwise have been a CO2 concentration from 412 to 411.934 parts per million by volume. Oh yes, this is big stuff here. And that in turn would reduce global temperatures by 0.00036 Celsius. That is all. But the cost, oh yes, the cost, 11.5 billion for carbon trading, uh, 2.5 billion more for innovation. These are figures in Garneau's report. Admin costs of 1.6 billion. That's in Penny Wong's last submission to the Budget Committee of your Parliament. Total of at least 15.6 billion a year escalated not only at 3% per year for growth of GDP, but at 4% on top. That's what Ghana recommends. And we're leaving out in this the 40% increases in electricity and gasoline bills you've already had to pay over the last few years since the Rudd and Gillard governments came in. We're going to leave those out of account altogether by being really, really generous to the other side. It's the only way to do these sums in the end. But even then, your total cost of the ETS proposed by Garno will be 231 billion pounds, dollars I should say, by 2020. And that would work out, if you wanted to forestall one Celsius degree of warming, at 634 trillion dollars. And if you were to just try to prevent the 0.23, 0.24 Celsius of warming predicted by the IPCC for the next 10 years, just to prevent that much over that next 10 years, then that would cost you $21,000 over those 10 years from every man, woman, and child on the planet. Sir, I'll take your check now. <laughs> and that is 21.3% of everything we make and do and sell throughout the world, throughout the next 10 years. That is how silly this carbon tax is. And I wanted to put numbers on it because otherwise it's just hand -waving. I wanted you to see just how catastrophically expensive this is. So what then would be the cost of sitting back and doing nothing? And here we're going to take the Stern report because it produces the most extreme figures. And before we do it, we'll just look at what is the consensus of the economic literature. Now, of course, we don't do science by consensus, but the great thing is that they do. And on the economics of climate change, the consensus in the literature is entirely, or very nearly entirely, with us. The consensus is, in paper after paper after paper, over the last 10 years, that it is far, far cheaper to do nothing about global warming, to allow it to happen, and then to spend whatever money might be necessary, only where and when and to the extent necessary, on focused adaptation to any consequences that may occur. And this graph on the left with the peer-reviewed papers shows that. Then the Stern report, uh, cost by the way, this is economic, so everything's upside down, the cost uh, is going down the page. The, the more the cost, the lower the line. He's, he's reversed it. He's ignored the economic literature, substituted his own numbers, a technique we've seen time and time again before. But let's start with his numbers. And let's then correct for the fact that he uses an unpardonably low 0.1% discount rate when working out the relative value of spending money now or letting our descendants spend it later. And we adjust for the Treasury's correct discount rate, which is about 3.5%. Uh, and we then find that his estimate that doing nothing will cost 5 to 20% of global GDP, if we basically don't discount it at all, 
comes down to only 